Hello folks, Sam from Florida, Guana. Uh, today I want to talk to you about parasites. I get a lot of people asking me about parasites. Should they treat them? Should they not treat them? How do you treat them? Um, what are some of the techniques in treating them? And how do you recognize that you have parasites? Uh, and, and basically, you know, what's the protocol? Do, do I actually uh, treat my animals or do I not treat my animals? Uh, some people do a combination of, of uh, different techniques. Some people will check for parasites and then treat those particular animals for parasites. So there's a lot of different ways to handle this situation. I'm going to try to run through it as systematically as I can uh, to show you what, what we do here. Uh, parasites are either internal or external parasites. This particular video is only for internal parasites. External py parasites like ticks and mites and, uh, and things like that, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it in another video. We have some separate products also for those. Okay, so what do we do? How, how are we going to test for parasites? There are a few different ways to test for parasites. Uh, there's some labs that you can take some samples with. You can take a little cup like this. This is what we do here. And then we'll, we'll get a sample from an animal that maybe we're suspicious that something has. And we'll put that sample in there. And uh, it's a pretty simple procedure. Uh, it costs about $12. We send that, that sample out to the lab and they send us back uh, a complete breakdown of what's in that stool. So, you know, we know if they have worms, we know to what degree or what level they actually have those worms so that's that's uh, one nice thing you don't have to do it yourself also you know you should be having a, a relationship with your local vet he should be somebody that you can come to and bring those samples to and get that and get those samples tested um, one of the main reasons you really should use your your local vet is even if I take that stool sample and I send it out to the to the lab they, they can't test for things that that uh, will die you know very quickly like like there's protozoas and there's amoebas and uh, you know different little critters in there like that so you know they can't test with those things so you can be sending these stool samples out to the lab getting back what you think is a great lab report doesn't show you the whole story because it's not testing for something particular only really two ways to test the parasites uh, protozoa get with your local vet establish uh, a routine with him where you're going to bring in some samples and you want him to check them or do it yourself. A lot of folks do it themselves, uh, depending on the size of the collection you have. So there are some people in some very remote locations. There are people, uh, uh, customers that I have that are actually in other countries that look at the video. So you've got to be able to, if you don't have access to a vet, you know, you want to be able to, to tell if your animals have parasites or not, uh, get a microscope, learn how to do it. It's, it's really not that hard. So uh, that's, that's what we do here. We've been doing it that way for a long time. Uh, we have a couple of different screening processes that we go through, and we have a protocol where we have a schedule, and we're always worming those animals in, in spring and fall, basically. So you know, we do this prophylactic uh, 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 scheduling for, for parasites. And we also do spot, uh, um, spot checks for parasites. So what I'll do is, Somebody will bring me in a stool and say, hey, this stool looks loose, hey, this stool, this or that. And what they do is, and actually uh, some of the fellas on the farm are doing it themselves as well. We have a little clipboard here, and when we take those stool samples, we write down who did the stool sample and what did they find. So keep your records, keep your records is important. Have a way of identifying your animals so you know that animal and you know what his history is so that you can follow along on um, you know, things that are medically important like weight and size and growth like that and you can look back at his records and see you know how you've been worming in or if he was missed somehow in the protocol and that particular animal isn't warmed. it can happen easier than you think sometimes you move animals around and you forget well, who's going where uh, uh, the folks that have bigger collections i know some of the folks that follow me have huge collections so you know some of this information is made for those folks some of the folks, uh, you know, have a, have a tortoise, maybe have two tortoises. Those people should be going to their local vet, should be establishing uh, um, uh, a protocol with the vet uh, where you're collecting samples. You don't want to, you don't want to be able to uh, bring the tortoise there and wait for him to go. You know, he might not go. So you can collect your sample in those little cups I talked about, and you want to get it to the vet quick because that protozoa is going to die before he gets there, and you're going to miss. The, the whole reason for the test so it's 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 the vet has to actually be able to, to kind of do that sample pretty quick don't want to get it done three or four hours later when there's a big chance of missing something that was important there so keep your records what we do in identifying the animals also is if we have an animal that we're suspicious maybe something's wrong we take this white marking pen a lot of people have seen those white marking pens that i use 
and you know you identify him uh, with his with his weight, and then we know, you know, what we've got to do to, uh, you know, what what the dose is actually for those for those animals. Okay, so uh, just to back up again, well, under the microscope we can find things like coccidia, we can find things like protozoa, and not every protozoa is a protozoa that you necessarily necessarily want to treat. There are some protozoa there that help break down in tortoises the digestion of a lot of the grass and vines and weeds and stuff like that. They eat the hay that they eat. So you've got to know when, when to when when to treat and what not to treat because you have to know exactly what animal you're looking at. Both of them are protozoas, and, and one of them is one we don't treat, and one of them is one that we do treat. It all has to do with the level of infection. So if you again, if you're going to do the job yourself, learn what you're doing so that you can you can determine what you're actually looking at, not that you just see something wiggling under the microscope. That's not, not actually going to get it done. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the protocols. The protocols are, people ask, should I treat? Or should I uh, prophylactically? Or do I just test? And then if my animals end up with uh, uh, some sort of a uh, parasitic infection, do I then treat? For me, it all really depends on how many animals you have and how stable that collection is. If you have two Aldabra tortoises and you don't have any other tortoises and there are no other tortoises coming in and going out of your collection and your tortoises are inside most of the time, the possibility of that tortoise actually getting something is very low. That doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we're, 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 we're not going to pay attention if he's sick. There's signs that those animals are sick with parasites. They, be, they become lethargic. They don't eat as, as well. And so you're going to need to check those. So that would be a situation where you might take that particular sample, bring it to your vet. Hey, you know, I want to get this. I want to get this checked. In those bigger collections, if you if you folks have a lot of tortoises that are coming in and going out, there's a lot of change. Maybe you're you're bringing in some new species. You're selling out some old species, and you have a lot of traffic. You have a lot of traffic from uh, from people coming and going, um, and and. and even other animals in your in your warehouse or in your facility then you really should be doing the protocol you should be worming those animals in the spring in the fall and and just worm all of the animals deworm all of the animals and i still would advise uh going back and checking making sure that that you still do not have that that, that you in fact even though you're treating you can't just forget about it and say, oh, well, I treated, it's done. You've got to really figure out, do they still, are, are they good still? So even after you treat, we're going back and we're looking at those, at those uh, stools and we're making sure that we don't see, so we don't see any of those parasites. Sometimes you can have certain animals that have lived with parasites for a long time. You follow your protocol, you're giving your, you're, good, you're giving your, your panicure, you know, uh, every uh, every two weeks, twice or three times in a row, and you s would suspect that you don't have a, a parasite infection because you've done everything that you're supposed to. You can't look at it that way. You still have to go back and look at those stools, keep your records. What did you find after the protocol? Was it was it uh, did you know all the animals healthy now? Do we no longer see parasites and everything like that? So. Okay, what did we treat these animals with? There, uh, there's a couple different groups of, of, the, of these parasites. You have worms, and you have protozoa, and you have coccidia, which is also a single cell type of protozoan, but that's another story. But those three groups of animals deal with, are treated by different types of drugs. So uh, it's important to make sure you're giving the right dose for the weight of the animal that you have. And if you don't know how to do that, then you, what you do is you make again a connection with your vet you allow him to help you or show you give you the proper amount of medication to treat your animal you don't want to screw it up and you don't want to guess and go in the store and buy something that you think says panicure and then find out that a lot of times this is a, a, a is really a typical is a horse uh, type of uh, of anti proto anti um, uh, dewormer so you don't, sometimes these drugs are mixed with other things that we don't use in tortoises and iguanas. So you want to make sure fenbendazole, that's what you're getting. There's nothing else in that fenbendazole. Again, that's why I'm saying, you know, go to your vet, make sure you're talking to your vet and he understands, you know, what, what you need to actually, what you need to actually get done. Well, the different drugs we do treat with for worms, 
and, and I see it all the time, uh, a, a lot of people up on videos treating their worms with Panicure. But, but folks, that's not the end of it, because Panicure does not hit all of the worms. There's a drug, uh, Parasit Quintel here is uh, Dronsin, and this is a drug that kills the other spectrum of those worms. So all the time I'll see people dealing with Panicure, but they're not testing. Again, they should be testing, identifying the worms they have, and they should be using Dronsin as a complement to Panicure. Just can't, just can't use one because it just doesn't work that way. So, so what some folks do is they alternate that. Again, that goes back to your protocol. What kind of treatment regimen are you going to set up when you're going to give these animals uh, spring and summer? Some folks switch off. They give one time Panicure, one time Dronsin, one time Panicure, one time Dronsin. Those are things that, again, depend on the traffic in your area, how many times those animals are exposed to, to different animals, and so what is the possibility of contamination? And contamination sometimes doesn't just mean the fact that, that this animal is in the bin with that animal, because when you're out there and you're feeding and your workers are feeding and everything, you folks are carrying those germs and those, those eggs from those parasites all around on your shoes. So eventually they get to some other places and everything, and that's a reason, it's a good reason, a good idea to have your pens clean and you're changing out your substrates because those eggs will live in there. Some there's all, some of them live in an incredibly long time. A lot of them, they'll live around two weeks. You wanna make sure you're getting that stuff out of those, out of that pen and you're putting that in the substrate so those animals, again, don't just uh, re-ingest that, that parasite. That's what happens in the system. It just keeps going around. So, Panicure Dronson. Hey, there's even some neat little stuff here. This is a, a non-injectable. This is actually absorbed through the skin, Profender. So I've used this sometimes. It's actually pretty neat. You can, again, hit certain spectrum. Um, maybe you're somebody that's in a remote location. You don't feel comfortable with tubing or wrestling that animal to be able to get in his mouth to deliver that medication. Maybe that uh, the drug that's absorbed from the skin might be something that will work for you. Um, this is the latest and the greatest here in Coccidia. You know, typically we use a lot of different types of sulfur drugs. Our trimethoprim sulfur diazine was a drug we used a lot. Different sulfur drugs are used for treating Coccidia. This Baycox is the best stuff out right now. Again, comes from the horse community. But this is the best stuff for treating Coccidia and, and it has even in some cases shown to be uh, to treat internal uh, uh, inter internucleated coccidia. So that's where the coccidia is actually inside the cells. So that's uh, that's something good to do as well. You folks that are on, the, that have the bigger scale uh, animals, you have to be able to be prepared to, to treat the animals. And, and by that I mean is what you do, just what we do here is I make sometimes I make my own combinations of drugs. So you know, I deal with a lot of different sizes. I might be dealing with something that's 20 grams, and I might be dealing with something that's that's 250 grams, 500 pounds. So I have different medications ready to go so that uh, you don't have to go crazy and, 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 and probably, if it's difficult for you to get to the drugs to be able to treat that animal, then you're probably not gonna treat the animal. So set your protocol, know what drugs you're gonna need ahead of time, know the concentrations you're gonna need to ha ahead of time, get with your vet to help you make the concentrations or have them compounded at your drug store. And for those folks that know how to do it, mix it yourself. I, I do it all the time. You know, we use a suspension vehicle when we want to take different drugs that, that don't mix well in solutions. You use a suspension, uh, uh, and that, that really just, you, you just suspend the, um, the, the material, the tablet, the crushed tablets, the little grains, you suspend it. And that's the reason you have to shake a lot of these things to get that suspension, which is important. Remember to shake those things um, to get that that uh, that drug completely mixed so that you can uh, deliver it. We also have um, another popular drug is, is metrodiazole. So this is for protozoas. Um, this drug is uh, probably one of the only drugs that we use for, for treating uh, protozoas. And the thing is, is that it's difficult. It tastes terrible. So, you know, it's if you can get into this tortoise's mouth once, you know, you're lucky because the next time he ain't eating it. He's not. He's not going to eat it off the food and stuff like that. There are some other medications that we use uh, that you can put right on the food because they don't mind the taste. So they just they'll just eat it. But that's not going to happen when you come to need, needing to use flagyl or metrodiazole. So, 
that's that's good to have on hand as well. Uh, it, it, it comes in another form. You can you can actually buy this stuff now. Uh, this actually comes from South America. This is the one they use in South America. I see they're up on Chewy now and some of the other sites where uh, that metrodiazole is already mixed in a solution for cats and dogs. So you can you folks can go right there and buy it. It's it's uh, it's in a liquid now and it's much easier to dose because it, it, it's very hard to dose a, a tortoise a big hard pill unless he's a big tortoise like some of these guys that you have sitting over here a big tortoise like that you know I can give him five six seven eight ten pills whatever it is I wrap it up in a leaf and down it goes so you know it all depends on the size of the animal you're dealing with and knowing what you've got to do to be able to, to, to deliver that medication so again mix mix some of the different drugs uh, in, uh, in different solutions so that I know what I, I have to uh, I have everything already set for how I'm going to deliver that drug some of the other things that people have a hard time with, this is especially in tortoises, so we're going to have some additional clips that I'm going to tie in here, with how, how do you get into the tortoise? How actually can you deliver the medications into a tortoise? Well, the injectable ones, we know basically how to do that, we just have to inject them. But a lot of those drugs have to go by mouth. So how do you get into the mouth? Uh, I have this question all the time, especially some of the folks that are trying to worm their aldabras and everything. And it's a matter of technique, it's a matter of patience. I, I've been doing it so long, I've made some videos to show folks how it's actually done. But I make a lot of my own special tools. You see me mention these before, Camp Kenan. Kenan likes the, this tool. That was one I showed him, I don't know, about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, 15 years ago, but you know, that's a, one of the tools I make. I make them from uh, dining utensils. So there's a couple different ways to do it. And then what we do also, there's a couple different types of tubes that you're going to deliver that medication inside with. Now we're not tube feeding. If we're tube feeding a tortoise, like if we were going to tube feed this tortoise, their stomach is about halfway down. So I would mark this tube here because I know he's going to stick his head out. I would put a black line on that, and that's how far down I would stick that tube if I was tubing the medication. But a lot of times, again, it takes a little bit more patience, a little more technique, how to get that tortoise's head out of the shell when you're trying to stick something down his throat. Some of those videos are going to help you out. So I use different sides depending on the size of the, of the tortoise that I'm using. So we have some very small type of stainless steel tubes. We have these neat little rounded edges. We, we have different size tubes. We have tiny ones all the way up to big ones. So uh, make sure you get what you need for, for the job that you have to do. Okay, so again, we're talking about tube feeding, and we're talking about sometimes just delivering a bit of medication. Sometimes the amount of medication we have to deliver is so small. It might be it might be a tenth of an ml, it might be a half of an ml. We don't actually have to get his head all the way out of the shell to do that. These are where these little stainless steel tubes work really well, because even if you get his head partially out, you can stick that tube in, he sticks his head a little bit out, and you can deliver that medication. Now, you're, you're not through the stomach yet you're actually putting that medication in the esophagus further down but this is something we do all of the time uh, if, if you you've got to make sure you're giving the right amount of dose because you don't want them to aspirate that drug so you've got to pay attention to uh, what what volume you're giving make sure you're doing the right dose and everything but I'm going to have later in this video going to have some actual examples of the different ways that uh, that we actually with the different techniques that we use for delivering that medication. Um, so, yeah, I just want to mention, um, be careful what you're doing. There are some anti-parasitic drugs that are used throughout the rest of the animal industry, are very popular, like ivermectin, which is poisonous to tortoises, and sometimes that's mixed in with the panicure, and that's the reason I point that out. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're not using a very common drug that people use in other animals, and it's getting into your into your tortoises. It's toxic for those animals. So you've gotta be careful what your dosing regimen is. Find out your doses, make sure, keep your records so you know what's going on and make sure you don't overdose because you know there is there is some information out there about overdosing on panic here and it lowering the, 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 uh, the immune system of the animal especially the tortoises so uh, but that report was done on where that uh, they, they were they were overdosed uh, they, they were overdosed 
three or four times what, what, the, what the normal was. You've got to be careful for that too. There's a lot of older information out there that I've run into. I've seen some, uh, some vets run into it too. Years ago, you know, we used to dose it 100 milligrams a kilogram. We don't dose it 100 milligrams a kilogram. It depends on, you know, sometimes we'll dose it 50, some, a lot of times we'll dose it 25 milligrams a kilogram. So you've got to be, you, you've got to make sure you have the latest information because that is dosing regimens and, and, and percentages of how much drugs we actually use it changes over the years and gets updated because all of a sudden everybody started to realize we were really overdosing these animals, we didn't need to hit them that hard. So stay up on the current information when it comes to your antiparasitic medications, it's important. Uh, I hope you like that uh, video folks. Uh, if you, I'd appreciate if you're watching on YouTube to subscribe. Uh, support to me or uh, give me a like or a thumbs up. I appreciate it. Take care folks. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to attempt to uh, deliver the medication to this particular tortoise. Again, what you're going to do here is just kind of, kind of do a little sneak attack on his mouth there. You want to kind of get to the end and you want to get the tip of that in there just kind of wiggle it around. Go slow, you see how he sticks his head out. Go slow. Sticks his head out. You just keep gently working the tip of that into his mouth like it is now. Okay, I think you have some good light there. And you see he got his, his mouth open in there. Now we're gonna come out and he'll still he'll stick his head out a little bit. And that's when Mario will deliver the medication, go down a little bit. Yeah, and let him come out a little bit. There you go. Go ahead. Deliver it. There you go. So that's it. So this is not tube feeding. If we were tube feeding, that a tube would have to reach about the middle of his shell. That's where his stomach is. So this is not for tube feeding an animal. This is only for delivering medications, maybe an antibiotic maybe an antiparasitic, whatever it is you have. Because actually, you know, their neck is very serpentine. So unless they stick their head out, you can't really get that tube that far down. We're not going into his stomach. We're just kind of going into the base of his neck, which is the esophagus there. It's a small amount, but then he'll easily swallow it. You can't tube feed because obviously you need to put a bit much bigger volume. If you're going to put a big volume in there. You don't want to stick it in his neck. It's got to go in his stomach. So remember, this is not tube feeding. This is simply for delivering medication for a sick tortoise or something like that. We're going to go through and see if we can come up with a couple more examples. Next slide, folks. Hello, folks. This video was made for Instagram TV, so I'm really limited to 10 minutes. A lot of good information in that video still. It goes about 25 minutes. Make sure to follow it on my YouTube channel. I'll put a link in here for you, and you follow it. I appreciate it. Take care, folks.